So when faced with this correction, David said, you know what? The Lord's way is better. My way is not. And so since the Lord was gracious enough to send me this woman to remind me of what God would actually want me to do and how he would actually want me to behave, I'm going to start behaving differently. When confronted with a brother or sister in Christ that has a good point and is actually saying there's some things here you need to work on, that may be God talking to us. Just like David acknowledged here, we need to listen to that. So don't shoo it away. Actually take it to heart and choose to make a change. Because sometimes, just like he did in this story, God acts through people you don't necessarily expect. Hey, fellow tacticians. Be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on Tactics. And Chaplain's Report today is going to continue our series in 1 Samuel. So for those of you, because we did take a break for the holidays, we did one on Thanksgiving. And so for those of you who may not remember where we were last time in the story, what has happened is that David has been hanging out, hiding from King Saul, hiding out in the high mountains, and he runs across a guy named Nabal. And because he and his men have been there helping his men with the labor, helping protect the flocks and the sheep because he's a, a shepherd, he's been there working with his men and his hired hands and workers, trying to keep his flock safe because, you know, they're around and, and they do so. And then David asked for something in return, a little hospitality, take care of the, the men, make sure they have enough food, that kind of thing. And Nabal just flat out says no. Uh, Nabal just straight up refuses, actually throws some shade at him, doesn't want him around and says, I don't even know who you are, get out of here, that kind of thing. And so that's important to note because it is going to play into the end of the story. Because we saw what happened last time we left is that one of Nabal's own servants goes not to Nabal, but to Abigail, his wife. And the reason he went to his wife is because he thought he would get basically a fairer hearing from his wife that she'd actually pay attention to him. The servant actually acknowledges there, Nabal doesn't listen to anybody. He's not going to listen to me. When he finds out that David is really upset about this, it's not going to be something that affects him. And, and this guy is ready to go to war. And we see David is now because he's been not only denied you know, what he actually did help produce, but more importantly, he's been insulted. And this being in an honor culture is, is a very serious offense. The fact that he's been denied hospitality, he, he's ready to take out Nabal and everybody in his company. And so the servant goes with this news, not to Nabal because he doesn't trust Nabal. He goes to Abigail because he knows that she's trustworthy and level-headed and will actually do something about it as he states when he talks to Abigail about this, about what's going on with David. And so what happens is, after that takes place, where we pick up in the story, Abigail gets everybody together, and everybody that's under her charge, and gets together some baked goods and some food and some fruit from the land and that kind of thing, and they all get together, and she is ready and packs all of this up and brings it to David and brings it to his company and the, the band of soldiers that he's running here. And that's really where our story picks up. So let's go ahead and read 1 Samuel 25, verses 23 through 31. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted from her donkey and fell on her face in front of David and bowed herself to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my lord, be the blame. And please let your slave speak to you and listen to the words of your slave. Please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and stupidity with him. But I, your slave, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then, 
May your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be like Nabal. And now let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who accompany my Lord. Please forgive the offense of your slave, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil will not be found in you all of your days. Should anyone rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living, with the Lord your God, but the lives of your enemies he will sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And the Lord does for my Lord in accordance with all the good that he has spoken concerning you, and appoints you ruler over Israel. This will not become an obstacle to you, or a troubled heart to my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause, and by my Lord's having avenged himself, when the Lord deals with well with my Lord. Then remember your slave. There's several things to unpack in the speech that Abigail gives there when she runs into David, but there's a couple of things that I wanted to note here that I think we should especially zero in on. One is she took blame for something that was definitely Nabal's fault. Now, she does say in there that she was unaware of the situation going on, but she says, nonetheless, this is my fault. I want you to think about this. Now, Nabal should have done something, and he also should have acknowledged David when he requested some hospitality, and he also should have been the one that got in touch with his wife if he wanted her to do all of these things. He didn't, and he did not want to do these things. When offered that opportunity, he shunned it away hard, slammed the door right in David's face. Like It wasn't just that he rejected him. It's that he did so specifically with insult and with malice. He didn't just, it wasn't enough to just deny something to David. He actively wanted to insult him on the way out, cause as much pain as possible. This is a very malicious, evil person. And yet, despite all of that, and despite that being Nabal's problem that he had to deal with, what does Abigail do? She takes the responsibility. She says, David, this is my fault and my fault alone. Now, there's a couple different ways you could look at this, but I think part of that was because as a wife, as the woman that is in charge of the household, she saw hospitality as something that was chiefly her responsibility. Now, that's not to say that men do not also bear the responsibility of hospitality as well. Nabal should have taken care of this, like I said. In fact, there are several biblical examples, including Abraham, of men extending hospitality to guests and extending hospitality to those of goodwill. But Nabal didn't do that. Nevertheless, Abigail says, you know what? I'm going to take the blame for this one. I'm going to take responsibility. That's the man's job. He's the one that is in charge of taking responsibility. A good man will shield his wife from this kind of blame. But Abigail took on the blame herself of her own free will because her husband failed to do so. He failed the role of leader and head of the household. He's supposed to be in charge of all that, and he did the wrong thing instead of the right thing. And because of that, Abigail goes not outside of her role, but certainly above what her role would require if she had a godly man leading her in the head of her, her household. She did not. And so because of that, and because she was in a bad situation, she took that responsibility on herself. She shouldn't have had to, but the point is the godly thing to do in that situation, once it was already taking place, she made the godly decision. And that happens to a lot of people in a lot of situations when it comes to trying to serve God. There's a lot of times where we really shouldn't be in a situation if everybody was behaving the way that God intended. However, we wind up having to make a tough decision regardless. Because something has happened that put us in a not favorable position, we had to opt to do something that we wouldn't have normally had to do, but the godly decision is still to do the right thing. And that's what Abigail recognizes here, and that's what she does. And, you know, th there is a little bit of stroking the male ego here. I, I don't think that anybody reading this story would deny that, because remember, the insult that Nabal flung forward is one, and he, he knew who David was. There was nobody in Israel at this point who didn't know who David, the son of Jesse, was. He wasn't king yet, but he was a very famous person. People were singing, literally, this is part of the story. 
literally singing his praises in the streets about how he's slain 10,000 Philistines. And so he's a very, very famous person at this point. There's authorities running around looking for him. And Nabal goes out of his way to insult him and says, who is this David and who is this son of Jesse? Basically, get on out of here. I don't care about you. I don't care who you are. You're nothing to me. That's what he's actually saying. What does Abigail say? She not only says that David has, has acted correctly, she doesn't only show a ridiculous amount of humility, probably more than was necessary, and she not only acknowledges the good work that David has been doing for them and her family personally, but she also talks about his past, his history. She talks about the slings of his slingshot. What's that a reference to? Well, obviously, it's a reference to something that happened earlier in David's life when he slew the giant Goliath. And so there's a little bit of stroking the ego here, and that's really not a bad thing. Now, you don't need to be insincere. You don't need to flatter people under false pretenses or just to get what you want. But Abigail saw this as something that was necessary to kind of undo the stupidity of her husband. Like he was trying to, to go out of his way to insult David. She goes out of her way to kind of flatter David and counteract that. And so she's doing the exact opposite of what her husband was doing. And I want you to notice something else here too. And this is probably something that doesn't need to be stated for the 2,000 plus years that the New Testament has been around and about the 3,000 years since this has happened. Uh, most people place David's kingship at somewhere around uh, 1,000 BC. So this story has been around for about 3,000 years. And, and sadly, this is probably one of the first times, the first eras in human history where this is needed to be brought up, but it shows how timeless God's word is. Do you notice something interesting about Abigail being a woman in this situation? She did counteract the stupidity of her husband, but she did so utilizing her feminine qualities. She didn't deny it. She didn't try to cast it aside. She didn't try to behave and act like a man or look like a man or any of that. No, no, no. She embraced her femininity. She embraced the, the body and the role that God has placed her in as a woman and uses those qualities to diffuse the situation. Because what happened is she found herself in the middle of two hot-headed men acting irrationally, David and Nabal. Now, Nabal's the, the worst of the two, but it doesn't matter. These two people were about to engage in something very evil. They were about to engage in bloodshed, and this is something that Abigail brings up in her speech. And she, being a woman, steps in, says, you're both being ridiculous. You know, David, you're about to kill innocent people because your pride has been offended. And that's something she brings to his attention. She does so very humbly. She does so acknowledging that you, you are the guy that fights the Lord's battles. You are a representative of the Lord. And you know what? God is going to set up your house to rule over Israel. Do you really want to start out your tenor as the king like this? Is this the person that you want to be? You see, Abigail is playing the role of the anima. She is the mirror upon which David's character is reflected. And that's something that women are better at doing than men. They just are. They always have been. That is the role that women play for us. Now, I could go through an existential romp through biblical history and show how this has always been true. Literally since the beginning, Eve plays that role to some degree in the creation story. We can see it again with Sarah. We can see it with the other female patriarchs, The uh, which, which kind of sounds like an oxymoron, but you know the, the matriarchs of the Jewish culture, the ones that are married to the patriarchs, they play that role to a great degree. That's what the female is. And I mean, you could do it as something as serious as biblical narratives, or you could look at you know, for example, Nala in The Lion King. Women have played this role in narratives throughout human history. You know, Simba thinks he's doing pretty good at hanging out with Timon and Pumbaa and just, you know, goofing off and eating bugs all day. And then Nala shows up and is like, you're worthless. This is not the person that you are. I see the king that you could be, and you're not living up to it. That's exactly what Abigail does here. She shows up to David's front door and says, you're not being the person that God means you to be. She doesn't necessarily say it in so many words, and she does it with a little bit of flattery and, and explaining that she actually does believe David is a good man who fights the Lord's battles and is better than he is currently acting. And that's really the role that she plays here. And because she embraced her femininity and embraced her role as a woman dealing with two hot-headed men, 
she's able to diffuse the situation. And we'll see how this story ends up here in 1 Samuel 25, 32 through 35, which reads, Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me, and blessed be your discernment, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, there certainly would not have been left to Nabal until the morning light as much as one male. So David accepted from her hand what she had brought to him and said to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you and granted your request. I really love this story because of the players and the interplay here. Do you notice something that David said at the beginning? You know what? You're right. You kept me from shedding blood today. You kept me from making a huge mistake. You made me realize this. Now, is David somebody that just goes around killing random people who have offended him? No. We just read a story a couple chapters ago where he had the opportunity to kill Saul, his mortal enemy, who has been seeking his own life, trying to kill him, trying to do him harm. And yet, despite that, he's about to go kill a random stranger who, granted, offended him and didn't do what he should have done, but that's a little different than actively going out and trying to murder him, which Saul did, and he spared his life. And so what this does is, and Abigail placing it in these terms, it forces David to do a a gut check. He has to step back and go, you know what? This isn't really reasonable. This is not what God would want me to do. And I was about to kill a whole bunch of innocent people that really had nothing to do with this just because I had a tiff with one person. And David is remorseful and he says, it must have been God that sent you to me. And you know what? He's right. I'm not saying that God directly as a voice sent down into Abigail that, hey, you need to go bring these things to David, because I don't think that's what happened at all. I don't think that the scripture portrays that at all. I think what happened is exactly what was supposed to happen, which is God put inside Abigail through teaching, through admonishing, through encouragement through the years, a spirit that wants to do what God wants her to do. And the same thing happened to the servant that actually went to her and trusted her and said, you're the one that needs to take care of this because Nabal ain't going to do it. So I think that God, through his providence, is working through these people. And whether he did it directly through his influence, you know, maybe gave him a little nudge, or whether he just instilled good values and a good conscience in these people to put them in the right positions at the right time, I have no idea. I don't know how God did this, but the point is he did it, and David acknowledges God's role in that, which is exactly what he should have done. And this forces David to take a step back and go, you know what? I've acted incorrectly. I let my pride get the better of me, and I let my wrath just sort of go out of control because of my pride. And so he says, because of that, the Lord must have sent you, and I'm going to listen to the Lord. That's a pretty profound thing that he realizes there. I think it's important that Abigail, through humility, hospitality, and responsibility, was able to cool down the situation. And then David acknowledges his own folly, his own flaws, that he has messed up here. And I think that that's something that required a, a good deal of humility on his part as well. He says, eh, I probably shouldn't let my pride lead me to murder random people. <laughs> that's a good rule of thumb, by the way, if you're out there listening. But I think that this really illustrates the difference between David and Nabal. Because as I said a couple lessons ago, when we looked at David's initial reaction, Nabal's a bad guy. David's also a bad guy. They are both acting incorrectly and out of step with what God would have them do. Now, did Nabal put David in that situation? Sure. But does that excuse David's behavior and reaction to it? No, it does not. David, of his own accord, did this. And yet, when God sends Abigail a messenger to tell him, look, you're not acting the way that I want you to act, David takes a step back and goes, you know what? You're right. I'm sorry. I messed up. I'm not going to go through with this. That's what a good man does, and that's what sets David apart from Nabal, because both acted incorrectly initially, but the difference is when the Lord offers some correction to David, David takes a step back and goes, you know what, Lord? You're right. I'm sorry. I screwed up. Nabal wasn't going to. We've already seen that from Nabal's character. And so what we have now is a contrast between these two. We can choose 
to either be a, a reactionary like David, and when we do overreact and when we do mess up, we, we choose to instead go with what God would have us to do and correct ourselves, or we can be like Nabal, who's so stubborn and pig-headed that we just stay on our course regardless of whether someone brings up, hey, you're not doing this the way that you should. You know, it reminds me of a quote from C.S. Lewis where he says, we talk about progressive and we talk about who is the most progressive. He says, but the thing is, sometimes the most progressive thing a person can do is if they are on the wrong track, if they are going down a pathway that is the wrong pathway, the most progressive man is not the one that continues down the wrong pathway. It's the one that turns around and heads in the other direction. Now, that would seem not progressive to the person that's walking backward. But if you took a wrong path, the most progressive person is the one who's actually going backward so that he can find the right path. And that's exactly what's happening here. David was on the wrong, wrong track. So was Nabal. The difference is Nabal saw the other path and goes, no, thank you. I'm going to stay the way that I am now. David says, yeah, I should adjust my behavior here. I, I screwed up. And that's the difference between these two. So I guess, and this is a good time of year where everyone's focused on being men of goodwill and, and trying to focus on being a better person. This is a good time of year to bring this up because you really... I think a lot of us kind of go back and forth between being a David and being an Abigail. Because a lot of times when put in a bad situation where people are acting that are in a way that is not in accordance to God's will, we have the option of either being an Abigail, meaning we're the person that hasn't done anything wrong, but we need to step up and take responsibility for maybe not heading this thing off earlier, or maybe not being aware of the situation beforehand, you know, maybe we didn't, we honestly didn't know, just like Abigail honestly didn't know, but we should have known. We should have been paying more attention. And so we step up and we correct lovingly. We correct our brother or sister that has gone astray and say, through a lot of humility, a lot of compassion, and not trying to berate them as an evil person that's lost and we cut them out of our life and they're dead to us. That, that's not the right way to handle it. We go up to them and say, look, there's some good qualities here. You can be better than this. God designed you to be better than this. He wants you to be better than this. We can be the Abigail in that situation. Or if we're the person that has been wrong, when faced with that correction, we can bow up, we can get defensive, we can lash out at the person that's making the correction and pointing out that we have acted incorrectly. David could have done any of those things, but he didn't. What he chose to do instead was be the progressive man and turn around and change his ways and learn from it. That's what God wants for his children. You know, instead of doing things our way, we surrender our will to God and do things his way because we understand in the end that's actually going to work out better for us. And David had learned that through years of experience. So when faced with this correction, David said, you know what? The Lord's way is better. My way is not. And so since the Lord was gracious enough to send me this woman to remind me of what God would actually want me to do and how he would actually want me to behave, I'm going to start behaving differently. When confronted with a brother or sister in Christ that has a good point and is actually saying there's some things here you need to work on, that may be God talking to us, just like David acknowledged here. We need to listen to that. So don't shoo it away. Actually take it to heart and choose to make a change because sometimes, just like he did in this story, God acts through people you don't necessarily expect. So that's going to be our Festivus episode. Thank you so much to all of my guests, Dad, Matt, James, and Laura. And thank you so much for being here with us. We're going to be back for another episode after the first of the year. No shows until after New Year's. But we'll be back and we'll see you next time. Until then, stay the course, friends. <laughs> To convince you to like this video and subscribe to my channel, I'm about to do some political impersonations. First up, Bernie Sanders. It is immoral that in this country, the top 1% of YouTubers get all the likes and subscriptions. John Kerry. Please remember to ring the notification bell. President Joe Biden. If you like the show, call the TV guide and tell them. 
<laughs> you know, the, the thing. Kamala Harris. Batman would want you to like and subscribe. <laughs>